Welcome to Cincy Reform Podcast. This is Pastor Brandon. And this week we continue with our series on the story of discipleship, where we are walking through the Bible's story on education, discipleship, catechesis. Last week we focused on Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and we looked at the numerous ways that creation and providence form a foundation for us as we we begin to think about the task of discipleship. And this week, the story continues to the creation of Adam and Eve in the image of God. As we examine the special creation of humanity, we can start asking questions like, how does this impact our view of education and discipleship? So coming to the text, Genesis 1.27 states, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so before we unpack what the image of God is, we should first note that a personal God created all things. Not only mankind in his image, but the world is created by God. And from this, we can glean a couple of things. First, we live in a personal world, a personalistic environment, you could say. And this is quite actually profound. How many, how many study or examine the created world as being impersonal? Whether we're studying math or science or history or ethics, we're tempted sometimes to view things as merely being impersonal disciplines that just exist somewhere out there. But it's quite different when we understand the world to be created by a personal creator and we are persons made in God's image, studying God's creation, when we view it from that angle, it postures us differently. When we view the world as personalistic and not impersonal, then we're ready to think God's thoughts after him. We're ready to be reinterpreters of God's original interpretation. But if we view our context and our world and the various subjects that we might study in school, if we look at them as being impersonal, well, that creates problems. We are postured to be autonomous, to be a law unto ourselves, where we think that we are somehow unshackled from God and doing our own thing and being gods in our own, in our own way. Cornelius Van Til said, If the most ultimate environment that surrounds man is impersonal, it is, in the last analysis, the task of the consciousness of man to determine the nature of that impersonal environment. In other words, if everything around us is chance produced by a random Big Bang and we evolved um, from uh, non-life into life into more complex life through macro evolution, well, that would mean that humans are the only personal thing in creation. It would mean that our minds must be the grand judge, the grand organizer, the grand interpreter of all the impersonal stuff around us. In other words, we would be completely autonomous. But, as Scripture makes clear, this is not the case. We are created in God's image, we live in God's world, we breathe God's air, we see, touch, taste, and examine things created by God himself. Another implication of being created by a personal creator and made in his image means that we are different from the rest of the animal kingdom. We are special creations of God. No other created thing is image of God. 
And that puts us at the apex, then, of God's special creation. But what is the image of God, and what does the image of God have to do with discipleship? Well, perhaps one of the best descriptions of the image of God comes from Herman Bovink. Herman Bovink said, and I quote, A human being does not bear or have the image of God, but is the image of God. This image extends to the whole person. Nothing in a human being is excluded from the image of God. While all creatures display vestiges of God, only a human being is the image of God, and he is such totally in soul and body, in all of his faculties and powers, in all conditions and relations. So, he goes on to say, the whole image of God in soul and body, in all human faculties, powers, and gifts, nothing in humanity is excluded from God's image. It stretches as far as our humanity does and constitutes our humanness. The human is not the divine self, but it nevertheless reflects a finite creaturely impression of the divine. End quote. So, as Boving is wanting to say, the image, we are image of God, and it, it extends throughout our humanness. And he goes on to talk about the soul and body, human faculties. Theologians often distinguish between the broad image of God and the narrow image of God. The broad image of God consists of things like body and soul, our cognition, our emotions, behaviors, our relational abilities, and so on. As Bovink put it, the image stretches as far as our humanity does and constitutes our humanness. And even after Adam sinned, humans are still broad image of God. But the narrow image of God, however, is true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness. And this aspect of the image of God was lost when Adam sinned, but is regained, is being regained in Christ when the Holy Spirit applies to us the redemption purchased by Christ. But what are, therefore, then some implications when we think about discipleship and education? What are some implications of the image of God, having the broad image, and if you're in Christ, having that um, narrow image being redeemed in us? Well, first, as we think about the broad image of God, we should note how multifaceted humans are. When we survey many secular educational ideas, so many want to focus on only one aspect of a person. Some only look to the intellect. Some only look to behaviors or only to the affections. Or some others want to only look at the relational context with other classmates. And all of these ideas fall short because they fail to educate the whole person. Nicholas Beversluis of Calvin College said that in the Christian school, we should, and I quote, think of the pupil as needing above all education as a human person. A Christian school should help prepare the pupil to know and accept himself in his wholeness. He went on to say, The call to faith is the call to be disciples of Jesus in their whole life. It is a call to be conformed to this model in the whole of their existence, in the whole framework of their beliefs, in the whole complex of their feelings and attitudes, in the whole gamut of their actions. Christian education, he, he concluded, must accept the wholeness of young persons and choose learning goals that will mature them as whole persons, end quote. 
So the image of God, I think, really helps us to think about discipleship, disciples and pupils of Christ, as being whole persons. Body and soul, intellect, emotions, behaviors, with the capacity and the drive for relationships, and so on. And this helps us to think, then, if we're going to educate, if we're going to grow and mature people, we ought to do it in a complete way. Not only focusing on one aspect, but looking at the broader context, looking at the whole person. And this is something actually the ancient church did quite well in their catechesis. For the ancient church, catechesis was not a mere intellectual game of memorizing, though they did memorize many things. But for the ancient church, catechesis was also liturgical. There were behaviors that you adopted in terms of spiritual and liturgical disciplines and postures. There were affections that you cultivated through ritual prayer, worship, psalm, singing. And yes, there were truths that you committed to memory and you learned very deeply to include the creeds, the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer. To put it simply, our discipleship must be a head, heart, and hands discipleship because we are image of God, and we must mature and grow as whole persons in Christ, balanced in Christ. Secondly, another implication of image of God for education and discipleship comes from the narrow image of God in that true knowledge, righteousness, and holiness should calibrate and set the direction for our teaching. The narrow image shows us, yet again, just how dependent upon God we really are. True knowledge comes from God, as told in His Word. Righteousness comes from Christ. Holiness comes from Christ. And the Spirit's work upon our lives. So discipleship and education, therefore, must come from Christ and be oriented back to Christ. As image of God, humans know many, many things, and we have the capacity to learn a great deal more. So in our discipleship programs, let us be mindful not to think of humans as brains on a stick, or as mere emotional creatures, or as animals who just behave in certain patterns. No, let us view humans as the apex of God's creation made in the very image of our triune God in the whole complete uh, way in which He has made us as humans, as image of God. So I hope that this episode was helpful for you examining the implications of the image of God on education and catechesis. Next week, the story will continue. Uh, But this time we'll be stopping at Genesis chapter 2. But until then, this is Pastor Brandon. Have a blessed week.